Good morning. I call this meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee to order and note for the record that a quorum is present. Our first order of business is approval of the minutes from Friday, May 3rd, 2024. Vice Chair Edelson, can I get a motion? That's my motion, Madam Chair. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the minutes have been approved. Our first bill on the calendar on the agenda for today is House File 4822, Representative Feist, the tax forfeited property excess sale proceed distributed, modified, and money appropriated. And so I move that House File 4822 be placed on the general register. And would you like me to move the A6 amendment first for you? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Great. So I move the A6 amendment and please explain your amendment, Representative Feist. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the amendment is primarily technical changes. We also made one um, change to ensure that this bill is constitutional. Um, and we also clarified, um, probably most important to you, is the um, money part of this bill um, to differentiate between the standing appropriations and the money um, that we are appropriating specifically to cover DNR costs. And that is at line 3.10. Thank you, Representative Vice. Any discussion to the A6 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A6 amendment has been adopted. So to your bill, Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this bill is a response to the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Tyler, um, which in May 2023 found in a 9-0 to zero de decision that our tax forfeiture laws were unconstitutional and a violation of the takings clause. Um, <coughs> so um, a whole bunch of stakeholders worked really hard together um, to come up with this bill. Um, that includes the counties, the DNR, the AARP, legal aid, um, and PLF, the Pacific Legal Foundation, which brought the original lawsuit um, that overturned our tax forfeiture laws. Um, and everyone worked together on this bill, and I'm really proud of uh, what we have come up with. Um, this bill makes a public auction mandatory when a claim for surplus proceeds are filed in order to pay out any excess proceeds to the property owner. And if I can just take one step back and explain what Tyler found, it was that when um, a property is forfeited on, um, the counties cannot keep any surplus profit um, beyond what that person owed in um, taxes and any fines and fees. Um, this also creates a process to ensure that the excess proceeds um, on minerals are not retained in violations of the taking clause. Um, it structures the allocation of funds to prioritize the property owner before dividing surplus proceeds, and it creates a process so that the DNR can continue to, to withdraw from sale forfeited property within public lands without violating the takings clause. Um, and it appropriates funding to the DNR to ensure that they can take on the new roles required under this law. Thank you. And that's the bill. Thank you, Representative Feist. Discussion to the bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Feist. Thank you for carrying this bill. It's appreciated. Um, basically, we have had the government engaging. It was one of the equivalent of uh, government-run equity skimming. It's uh, pretty egregious, and I'm glad that uh, we're addressing this issue. I did want to, something that we discussed privately, I want to make sure is still the same, and that is that the methods for determining what the appropriate value of the property is, um, any compounding of interest from proceeds, those are all laid out in the class action. Th those are the terms that we are we are bound to. Is that correct? Representative Feist. Yep, thank you. So um, this process will ensure that all property that is foreclosed upon will go through a public auction, um, which was an essential um, step in valuing the property to ensure that any excess proceeds go to the property owner. Um, it also lays out the um, process by which the fines and fees um, are, um, are determined and also divided up uh, between counties and local um, schools and cities. And so that is also laid out. One of the things that we changed mm -hmm. along the way um, was to change the order of those proceedings so that once the public auction occurs, we would take that surplus and put it aside before determining um, that division of fines and fees um, and determination of those those costs. Um, that's called the minimum bid. Um, and hopefully I explained that that well. But basically we we um, the public auction was a really important aspect of how we structured it, but then we further um, 
uh, restructured it to set aside those surplus proceeds and protect them from just being eaten up by all of the costs incurred by the counties. Lee Garofalo. Well, thank you, Manager. I don't, I don't know what the public option has to do with this. This is confusing to me that we would Nothing, huh? Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm Madam Chair. I would, I'm supporting the bill and encourage members to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion really to the bill? Uh, final word on your bill, Representative Vice. Um, thank you. Um, just wanted to again thank all of the stakeholders who engaged. Um, and specifically to tell the counties that I know that this the status quo is constitutional and that is important um, But it also is going to be a challenge to the counties as they evolve um, To the new normal and I am committed to continuing the work um, to see if there is a role for the state to help support the counties as they um, Move into this <coughs> new structure Thank you representative vice for all your work on this bill So I renew my motion that house file 4822 as amended be placed on the general register all those in favor Please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails in House File 4822 has been placed on the general register. Thank you. The next bill on the agenda for today is House File 5246, Representative Liss Lagarde. Welcome to the committee, Representative Liss Lagarde. And I move that House File 5246 be placed on the general register. And you have a amendment, the A1 amendment. So I will also move the A1 amendment. And I see you have Jared Swan <coughs> Swanson from House Research here as well. Um, would you like him to describe the A1 amendment or would you like to do that, Representative Lissagard? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, it's just really simple. It just inserts the word A, a county uh, that does not affirm, notify the claims by August 1st in writing that it is not participating will be deemed to have elected to become a participant. Okay. So. Thank you, Representative Lissagard. Any discussion to the A1 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A1 amendment has been adopted. <coughs> so to your bill as amended, Representative Lissagard. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. What I'd like to do is have um, Jared um, walk through the bill. This is the $109 million to, uh, that was agreed upon for the settlement. Um, and so if Jared could walk through the bill. Mr. Swanson, welcome to the committee. Mr. Swanson. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, Madam Chair and members, Jared Swanson from House Research. So House File 5246 <laughs> appropriates $109 million in fiscal year 24 to the Commissioner of Management and Budget to make payments for settling litigation related to the retention of tax forfeited lands. So where the previous bill um, deals with forfeitures going forward, um, this bill is, um, is an appropriation for uh, settlement of class action lawsuits um, related to the uh, retention of tax forfeited lands that forfeited prior to 2024. So payments under the terms of the settlement agreement would be made from the appropriation for properties that are located in participating counties. Um, and as uh, Representative Liz Lagarde um, just noted, the amendment would um, require counties to notify the claims administrator by August 1st, 2024 in writing that they do not wish to participate in the settlement agreement. Um, so any other pro any uh, county that does not do that um, is deemed to have elected to become a participating county. And counties that are participating uh, would agree to uh, provide the Commissioner of Management and Budget with any property tax records necessary to effectuate the settlement agreement. <coughs> they would agree to make a good faith effort to sell any properties that they are still um, holding on to that forfeited prior to 2024. And they would be required to remit a portion of the proceeds from the sale of those properties to the state. Uh, lastly, Subdivision 5 of the bill uh, would require participating counties to submit annual reports to the Commissioner of Management and Budget on properties that forfeited prior to 2024. And each report would need to include the date that each parcel forfeited, a description of the efforts made to sell the properties, and if the parcels were sold, the purchase price and amount remitted to the state. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Uh, discussion to the bill. Representative Gomez. Thank you, um, and I'm glad that Representative Feist is still here. I just want to say thank you to Chair Liz Lagarde and especially to Representative Feist. Um, this is an effort that the, the, the tax team and a lot of people all, from all over the state, most especially the counties and the AG's office, have been working on since last session, since this decision 
came down from the Supreme Court. Um, it's This is a very complex um, part of the tax statutes. Um, I learned a lot about it, but not enough to be able to shepherd the process, honestly. I tried for some months, and so I just want to, I've said this in tax committee, and um, just want to thank Representative Feist for her work on this. Um, you know, she worked a lot with with, with AMC, who's, who um, the Association of Minnesota Counties brought together a working group of counties from across the state. This particularly impacted, of course, Hennepin and St. Louis counties, and they have just been at the table for months and months and months, bringing their expertise. Um, Representative Feist actually, um, you know, struck a deal that everybody, including the AG's office, who's been at the table a lot, um, the counties, the, the state, and the original litigants who brought the case forward agree with, which is just, I was not expecting that. And so I'm just really, really grateful, and I want to thank all of the people. I mean, it's dozens and dozens of people across the state who have been, who have spent months working on this policy. And it's, you know, not super exciting maybe to, to a lot of people, but it is just the kind of work that we need to do. And so uh, thank you for the, for the indulgence, Madam uh, Chair, and thanks to everybody in the room who put so much work into this. And thank you, Chair Lissagard. Thank you. Further discussion to the bill as amended? Seeing none, a final word on your bill, Representative Lissagard? Please support. Great, thank you. Thank you for everyone for their work on these two important bills. So I renew my motion that House File 5246, as amended, be placed on the general register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and House File 5246, as amended, has been placed on the general register. Thank you. So our next bill on the agenda is House File 912, Representative Agbaje. The African American Family Preservation Act. And so uh, I will move on Representative Agba J's half, behalf that House File 912 be placed on the general register. And I will also move your author's amendment, the DE 8. And so when you are ready, if you could go ahead and describe the DE 8 author's amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. Um, the DE 8 basically updates the African American Family Preservation Act from being a full statewide program uh, immediately into a phase-in program starting with both Hennepin and Ramsey counties in 2024 and then um, after a working group deliberates on the data that's collected into a statewide program in 2027. Great, thank you. Any discussion to the DE-8? Lead Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Added to the author or nonpartisan research, do we have a updated fiscal note with the DE-8? Um, we can go to Representative Agbaje, but we have had quite a bit of discussion on this being a straight appropriation, and um, because of that, may, moving it into a pilot program, that it would not, we don't have a fiscal note, because in the way the DE-8 was written, we wouldn't need to, and I can turn to House Fiscal, but I'll go to Representative Agbaje for comment on it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Garofalo. Yes, we are doing a $5 million appropriation, uh, $2.5 million to Hennepin, $2.5 million to Ramsey. That is the number we agreed upon that they would need to implement the program in both Hennepin and Ramsey. Um, and then with the date further out for the statewide implementation, that gives us more time to understand from the feedback from the working group um, how much would be needed for DHS. Thank you. Lead Graflo, would uh, you like you. Um, Sure, just uh, specifically it's on page 16, uh, the advisory council and the funds for that. And they'll go to Representative Agbaje first, and then we can see about House Fiscal. The uh, well-being unit and the advisory council are already already exist within DHS. They implemented that about uh, two-ish years ago. Um, so the costs that they're using for that have they they've already incorporated those costs into uh, their needs, and so we anticipate that any further costs <coughs> that they would need would need to be brought up in a further budget year. Lead Garofalo. Okay. So the extra items in Section 11 that are listed, those are already being done? Representative Agbaje. Madam Chair, yes. Um, the Child Wellbeing Advisory Council already exists. They've actually, uh, they've started selecting folks for the council. I think they have started to have a couple of meetings. Um, same with the Wellbeing Unit. That's also a unit that exists and that currently has three staff members. Yeah. Lead Garofalo. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so to the author, so if they're if they're doing this stuff already, why do we need a new law? Representative Agbaje. 
Uh, Madam Chair, what sections, uh, what section 11 does with the council and with the well-being unit in section 12, it just codifies it, it's a statute. We want to make sure that they uh, stay within DHS since it was a, it was a policy that they implemented, which I'm glad they implemented, but we want to make sure that it has lasting power. Lead for Uncle. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just curious, uh, I think it was said that it's half a million dollars for each county. <coughs> Is that correct, Representative? Rep Representative Agbeche. 2.5 million, 2.5 million to Hennepin and 2.5 million to Ramsey for a total of 5 million. Representative um, Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, could you kind of elaborate, Representative Agbaje, on um, is that going mostly for hiring new people? What what do you see that money going for? Representative Agbaje. Yes, uh, both Hennepin and Ramsey have told us that they will use it to implement both uh, some additional hiring of staff, um, ensuring that the w workers have the resources that they need to to follow the families to, in order to implement the active efforts. If families need additional resources, I think some of the funding could come from that, um, as well as some training courses that, that staff would need. So it would be, I mean, it's going to be an iterative process through the working group to figure out exactly, you know, where the balancing is out at, but that is the initial cost that they've anticipated for right now. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, thank Madam you. Chair. I, and it's been a while since I've seen this. Okay, here we have reports. Um, Representative Agbaje, so I don't have to read and talk at the same time. Could you elaborate <laughs> um, again on what um, reporting mechanisms are part of this bill and how often they're going to be reporting um, the actions of this pilot program? Yeah. Representative Agbaje. Madam Chair, thank you, Representative Scott. So um, in the bill, we anticipate that uh, both Hennepin and Ramsey will start or will continue and, and, and update the collection of data on the number of families that they see uh, where those families fall, uh, disaggregating the data about the families that they may, that they maintain with. Uh, similar to another pilot that they had done, they'll also be looking to make sure uh, that they're keeping families together. So the reunification rates that they have, uh, the rates for out-of-home placement, um, and, and that type of data. So that way that can be fed into DHS to see how they can implement it statewide. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And if there are any leftover funds, will that just go back to the bottom line, or how will that work? Representative Agbaje. I don't anticipate there'll be any leftover funds, but <coughs> should there be, I, I imagine the straightforward process of how any leftover money comes back to the state, so. Thank you. Further discussion, Representative Krisha. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the bill author to nonpartisan staff. So um, we have a $5 million appropriation, if, the, if I'm reading this correctly. Uh, how does that interact how, uh, with the existing child welfare system? Is this, are they going to be hep, uh, uh, separate? Are they going to give recommendations? How is this $5 million going to be spent in that system? Representative Egg Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Krishat. So this is, the $5 million appropriation is specifically to be split amongst Hennepin and Ramsey to implement this program. So this will help them with how they can start to use active efforts, more diligent efforts, working with African-American families, uh, families from children who are disproportionately impacted in the system, uh, folks who are maybe have a low socioeconomic status or children with disabilities. So uh, the appropriation is specific to both Hennepin and Ramsey for what they need to, to do this work. Representative Krisha. So uh, to the bill author, if you could walk me through, let's say I have three cases. One is a uh, Caucasian, one is an African American, and one is a uh, Native American. No. Those three cases come to the system. How does this program impact those three cases? I will just say, Representative Krisha, being we're more of a fiscal committee in this bill, did have hearings in relevant <coughs> committees to dive into more of the policy and implementation around that. I'd prefer if we could stick more to the fiscal part. Do you want to, um, yep. do you have another question, Representative? I, I do, and Madam Chair, the reason I ask it is because what I want to get to, or at least understand, is if we're going to set financial resources aside, my, the reason I'm asking it this way, and it's not a policy question, is just understanding pragmatically how this works, because is there going to is there going to be a situation where they're going to be fighting over those resources and allocations? Um, that's what I'm trying to understand. Is if we're just setting these dollars aside, and I, I'm just trying to figure out how they would work and be spent in a year from now or two years from now, um, is Hennepin and Ramsey going to be coming back, or are they going to be moving dollars? As I understand the the welfare system or the county um, child protection system now, it's largely funded by uh, a county infuse and so 
I just see a situation that I'm, I'm trying to understand of how these resources are going to be allocated. So it's really not a policy question. It's pragmatically how these dollars and resources are going to work as three cases of, of dissimilar um, demographics would move through. Representative Agbeche. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Kreshat. So the effect of the program and, and the funding really is to support the efforts that counties are already doing for all families when they come in. What we're noticing is that there's various disparities between various demographics for a variety of reasons. So what Hennepin and Ramsey want to do is based on the language of this bill, how do we support more families with more diligent efforts, more active efforts as it's known in the bill to ensure that uh, you know, the non-custodial parents are being called, the, fam the next of kin is being called, any family friends are being called to ensure the, that the child can stay within their family network. Um, in the cases that you described, actually there's a number, there's already a number of various sets of laws. Um, all this is doing is sort of um, augmenting and amplifying the laws that are already on the books to say that if you have a child who is already experiencing um, some of the disproportionate impacts of our society that they would have to do a little bit more extra work for that. Um, you mentioned Native American children. There's already a specific law for them both at the federal and state level that um, counties are already doing that work, um, already using their specific funding to support those families. Um, and for anyone else who would qualify under the definitions in this current bill, Hennepin and Ramsey would do um, not the same but similar type of work to ensure that they can stay within their family network. Representative okay, thank you. Uh, so the interesting thing is I look at this, we're, th we're adding an additional $5 million um, that would be split between these counties, but we already know the disproportionalities. We already know the populations that need uh, the attention. And so it seems to me we're directing these funds when those funds would already be directed because of just the cases. So as somebody who's fought for funding for the child protection for a long time, it would make more sense to just put it into the child protection system and then let those disproportionalities determine how the resources. But um, I, I, I think, Representative Ag, um, Ed Bagjay, I see where you're going with this. I see what you're trying to solve. Nobody in the entire world has solved the disproportionality problem. I think this is going to create more schisms and fighting for resources, which I think is the opposite of what you're hoping for. But I'll leave it there. Vice Chair Edelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just, I want to thank, thank you, Representative Abadji. Um, this, I, I was a guardian ad litem with Hennepin County. And we knew disproportionality was happening um, 20 years ago when I was a guardian. Um, and specifically, black children were being taken out of their home at rates that we were not seeing for any other child. And so I think we do need to target these funds. And I'm really glad that you did. And I'm really glad, um, that you also are calling it the African American Preservation Act because we need to be very intentional about the fact that black children have been targeted in this state and across this country. So I and we need to make sure that we're healing that. So thank you so much for your work on this and thank you for your dedication. I know it's been a bumpy road, um, but you are persevering. So thank you. Seeing no one else to be recognized on the DE-8, uh, last word on, do you have anything to say before we move adoption of the DE-8? Uh, no, I think that's it. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the DE-8 <coughs> has been adopted. Um, so that was a DE, so it's pretty substantive discussion already, but would anybody else like to further discussion on the bill as amended? Steve Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the author for carrying this bill. Obviously, we have a, all have a shared interest in preserving families, uh, particularly the pilot project that took place in Hennepin County. I think there's some promising of uh, the existing project. I think there's some uh, promising outcomes that are there. Uh, I would highlight that um, in the packet we received uh, information that there is some concerns about the limitations about how, uh, I, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but the language was. Um, there has to be, there can only be involving sexual abuse, or I think the term was egregious, and that there's some concerns from the County Attorneys Association. You don't need to reference that. I know that you're a serious author, and you'll be working with stakeholders in this going forward. So I know there's a diversity of opinion on this issue, but I'll be voting in favor of your bill today. Thank you. Madam Chair, yep, I, can, I can just briefly yep. address that. I, I saw their letter. I think it was written a little bit after I had changed the language already or updated it. So we do have other variety of potential harms that, uh, children could face um, and other issues that parents could be facing to make sure that those are addressed as well. Thank you. Thank you.
seeing no further discussion, um, final word on your bill, Representative Agbeje. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, and to the committee members. I really appreciate uh, the words today and, and the, the substance of discussion on the bill. It is a <coughs> Very extensive bill. We're trying very hard to heal a very specific harm in Minnesota. Um, I think along with that comes a lot of opinions and uh, passions. And so um, as this bill continues to move, we will be continuing to take uh, different advice from different uh, stakeholders and interested parties, um, but really is just to ensure that we are moving forward and taking a real significant step to ensuring that more black families and more families of children who are disproportionately impacted by the system can stay together. So thank you for your support. Thank, thank you, you Representative Agbeje, and thank you for all your work on this bill. And I know Chair Moran had done work on this, and um, you're continuing and taking this bill further. And so thank you for everything, uh, uh, all your work on this. And with that, I move that House File 912, as amended, be placed on the General Register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails in House File 912, as amended, has been placed on the General Register. So our last bill today uh, is House File 4571, the Health Supplemental Budget Bill. And I will just say we had hoped we would get the Senate file in time to be able to <laughs> put the House language onto the Senate file because that makes it a lot easier on the front desk staff. Um, and for staff at this time of year, any, any amount of time saving things we can do is good for them. So we don't have currently have the Senate file in our possession, but we will once we gavel in for session and go through the motions on the floor. And so our plan is to walk through the bill, have our discussion here while we have time, um, and then we will come back, we'll recess, and we will come back later today. We'll probably meet in Capital 120, so just keep your ears on for notification about when that'll be. It'll be after we have possession of the Senate file, and that we will move to put the House language onto the Senate file, but we will not, we'll do all of our debate and all of our work in, in the substance now, so that that will be a procedural motion, so that then we can go back to the floor. And again, that is for the benefit primarily of staff um, to have a lot less work in terms of trying to put every one of these pages into a journal as well as the Senate file, um, to just have them do it once. So um, so that is the plan if everyone will move forward with that. And so I move that House File 4571 before the committee, and it will be laid over, as I mentioned, so that we can insert the House language onto the Senate file <coughs> later today. So Representative Liebling, you also have the A20-1 A20 author's amendment. Would you like to describe that? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, so um, the author's amendment looks a lot more extensive than it is, and let me just kind of describe briefly what's in it. First of all, it has a lot of technical corrections and clarifying language that come from either nonpartisan staff or agency staff. The, a big chunk of language in here is medical debt language, and the reason that is here, this is actually being dual tracked. It's in the Commerce uh, Finance Bill, I think, or maybe in the Policy Bill. Anyway, it's intended that it will uh, be enacted in a different bill, but we are just dual tracking it here. So this language that's in this amendment is just simply lining it up with the current language in the other bill. Um, this amendment deletes Article 11, which was kind of a small article, but it uh, was a policy piece, and just deleting it having to do with um, substance use disorder personnel and just uh, because there just wasn't agreement among stakeholders, so we're just taking that out. The big fiscal changes in this are the mental health rate increase that is being included. And um, also adding some funding here for reforms to prior authorization. So those are the big changes um, that are taking place here in the um, author's amendment, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Liebling. Any discussion to the A20-1 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A20-1 author's <coughs> amendment has been adopted. So we'll have you walk through the bill now, Representative Liebling. All right, well, thank you, Madam Chair. And you know, as with most uh, health bills, a an actual real walkthrough would probably take a lot more time than people are willing to, to do today, Hit even the though- the lights and the fiscal and you know- All what right, you sure. And even though I was gonna yeah. say, this is kind of a, um, a baby of a bill compared to what we often have in, in uh, health. 
So this is, uh, I don't know how many pages it is. It's in the th early 300s. It's not like a thousand page bill like we often have. But um, the one thing I would say, the kind of the main thing about this bill is that we had a tiny little target for us. Our target was only nine and a half million dollars across the four years. But with that tiny little target, this bill has a very big impact. So um, the main areas of spending in the bill are, um, first of all, for mental health. Um, we have $28 million for mental health in this bill. Um, we have, including the rate increase that I mentioned, which is uh, hugely important. It is really a down payment on what we need to do in this state, but it's hugely important. Another one is we have uh, insurance improvements of about $9 million, and the bulk of that is covering orthotics and prosthetics to the degree that we really need to be covering them in this state, and that is most of that money. Uh, over $7 million of it across the, the four years is going to that. Um, and I, I just feel extremely proud of our doing that because this is, you know, if you think about it, somebody not getting the right prosthetic that they need is just a huge impact on their life. And if we want people on our public programs in particular, but all Minnesotans, to be able to be productive and live to their highest, and so on, giving them a simple tool, I guess it's not so simple, but you know, the prosthetics and orthotics they need is hugely important. Another big area of spending in the bill, relatively speaking, is for pharmacists. And we have some different provisions in here that total $3.2 million and uh, kind of in three buckets of uh, improvements for pharmacy services. So, you know, I can kind of stop there. Um, that's, um, you know, like, like all health bills, HHS bills, there are lots and lots of other tiny things in here, and uh, it's just, I'm, I feel very happy with the way this bill has shaped up, and uh, that's it, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Liebling. And we have one more amendment we're gonna take up now before discussion of the bill, the A24 <coughs> amendment. And so, Representative Agbadje, you would like to move the A24 amendment? Yes, Madam Chair. Great, so the A24 amendment is before us. If you could describe the amendment. Yes, uh, so thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Representative Le uh, Chair Liebling and I have been in discussions with a number of other folks about how to address the um, artificial flavor, synthetic flavoring for cannabis ban in this bill. I think we've come to uh, language that uh, everyone can live with. Um, and so this bill uh, basically kind of updates that section a little bit to uh, streamline it to be very specific to artificial and synthetic flavoring um, in cannabis products or the component parts, um, ensuring that those uh, flavors do not enter uh, cannabis products. And so that way we can at least start to put a line in the sand of the way to start to protect children from cannabis flavors in various products that are out there. So, Thank you, Representative Agbaje. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think uh, Representative Agbaje really explained it very well, and I support the amendment. Okay. Yeah. Great. Further discussion to the A24 amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A24 amendment has been adopted. And so now discussion to the bill as amended. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I have just a few questions on the, the bill today and the amendments that uh, we had adopted earlier. And I'm just gonna focus the questions today on the lines 214 through 219 of the uh, tracking sheet, and that's the prior authorization portion, and um, I'm just asking for a little latitude. We just got the fiscal note on this portion uh, last week to start to understand, and this is the first time we've been able to have any kind of uh, hearing or, or public testimony on this uh, particular fiscal note. And so uh, just to start with the um, those lines in here for this portion of the bill, what's on the spreadsheet doesn't match what's in the fiscal note. And so I guess my first question would be just what, 
what's the difference in between the bill that was presented that this fiscal note was built on and what is in uh, your bill today, Representative Liebling, where, where the difference is to get to the numbers we have here. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, thank you for the question, Representative Schumacher, and I don't always thank people for their questions either, so I appreciate this one, though, because it, it does, this is a really important piece, and um, I, I'm gonna let Mr. Harney um, answer some of that, but first I wanna just say that we have been working really hard on the assumptions in the fiscal note and kind of, obviously, it's a question of what we can afford and, and uh, where we could really make the most impact for what we can afford because, uh, you know, as you know, prior authorization practices are, can be pretty destructive, I would say both to people's health care, their ability to get care that they have paid for in their insurance product and um, or, or under public programs. And uh, also, it's really destructive to our medical community. They spend, um, providers spend huge amount of their time trying to get prior authorization for, for care and it's contributing to burnout and it's wasting their valuable time that they could be using to see patients. So I know you know all of this, but I think it's important to kind of state the premise um, here. And so we worked really hard on the assumptions in the bill and really pushed uh, DHS in particular to delve into a little more of the, you know, where the numbers are coming from. And then we did some picking and choosing of what we were able to do. So I'm gonna turn to Mr. Harney for some of the details. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Harney. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, Madam Chair, Joe Harney, House this goal. Representative Schumacher, the committee on April 19th accepted an amendment that um, included prohibitions on prior authorization for three things. So that was oral buprenorphine, stage four cancer drugs, and then mental health and SUD outpatient um, treatment. The completed fiscal note was on those three components. The amendment that the committee just adopted gets rid of the stage four cancer drugs costs. So that those costs are buried but outlined on the fiscal note there um, that was completed last week. And just for the sake of being complete here, I'll note that on page six at the Department of Health, page six on the tracking sheet, excuse me, there are costs to the Department of Health for data collection. The author's amendment again amended the language that left committee to get rid of the analysis that was included in the completed fiscal note. So what is before you in the amendment and on the spreadsheet is just the data collection at MDH as well. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for, for that, uh, the response there. And uh, Representative Liebling, I, I understand what you were saying about prior auth. I don't know that I would necessarily agree with it, but do understand that uh, piece of it. Uh, one thing, uh, too, I wanted to ask about in, in this and some of the changes in the numbers there is the cost to see give in here. I know there's a, I don't know that it was mentioned in the amendment, and so I just wanted to see where, how that tracked in the, in the efforts here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Liebling. Yeah, I'm gonna ask Mr. Harney to speak to that. Mr. Harney. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Schumacher, uh, I could spend a lot of time talking about CGIP fiscal notes. I'll try to give you a Spark Notes version here. Um, so when they respond, they respond on behalf of the enterprise. So that's every state agency as an employer of people and their costs reflect the employer share of the premi premiums that are paid out of the state operating budgets. So that's really built up in their fiscal note to a top line number. It's more informative than practically dealt with in an appropriation section because again, those costs are borne out from the agency operating budgets. I believe the fiscal note had something like two and a half to $3 million in general fund costs for CGIP. It's just important to note that that is at the scale of the state as an enterprise. So that's every state agency, that's every operating budget, and it's not included in the tracking here so as to reflect the requirement for the agency operating budgets to absorb those costs. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the cost of this provision, the assumption is that each department will just absorb the, the, the cost for that, or will it move to more of a, a premium change? Representative Leaving, Mr. Harney. Mr. Harney. M M okay. Madam Chair, so the, the practical effect is this. It's either a change in the premium or if the agencies are unable to absorb the change in the premium to their operating budget, 
the next for, for the next plan year, they would come to the legislature for a change item request. But again, I'll restate once more that this is at the scale for the entire state as an enterprise. And Madam Chair, Representative, and if I could just add from my understanding, what kind of the bottom line is that if we were to appropriate money for that, it's not very meaningful because it, it, because of the way the the costs are, how they come in, and how you would distribute uh, an appropriation. At least that's my understanding. Mr. Harney. Yeah, Madam Chair, CGIP operates as an internal service fund. The legislature really doesn't generally directly appropriate to internal service funds because the agencies contribute to that fund vis-a-vis -vis their operating budgets. Representative Schumacher. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And just one final question on the fiscal note for, for now as I'm still trying to digest some of that. But uh, when you talk about some of the assumption changes or... Um, the discussion on the assumptions. I'm curious on the page 13 of that fiscal note when DHS assumes in their assumptions in section three, section three is assumed to not to apply to MAP for service and would have an indeterminable impact on managed care organizations who provide <coughs> coverage and for MA and Minnesota care enrollees. Um, it, does that con assumption, did that get settled out when, when uh, changes were made for this amendment or are those still unassumed and this may be a better question for DHS on why why those were um, indeterminable. Mr. Harney. M Madam Chair, Representative Schumacher, I, I probably right, correct, a better question on the details for DHS. I'll just note that indeterminable costs on fiscal notes, especially in forecasted programs, will be caught in the next economic forecast if those costs show up. Representative Schumacher. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for um, helping me out with understanding some of these things. Uh, we'll keep it brief today in, in just closing. Still going to oppose the bill, although I think it's in better shape than when it left committee, especially with the, the efforts that were made to, to fund some of the mental health pieces, and they're really happy to, to see you're able to get that done with that, still have concerns that the changes with uh, the prior authorization and and some of the mandated coverage pieces are going to increase the costs uh, to ratepayers in the state at the same time uh, getting rid of or banning uh, for profit HMOs is going to reduce the choices that people have in the state when they choose who's going to help them pay for their medical coverage. And uh, for those reasons and a few more that I've already described in other committees, I would ask members to vote no. Thank you. Further discussion to the bill as amended? Seeing none, Representative Liebling, uh, last word on your bill. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And as I understand, we're not voting on it now. That's we're correct. just going to lay it over. So, I, so that takes a little of the drama out of it. <laughs> 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 but, uh, no, I, uh, I'm very proud of this bill, as I said. Not only we have the mental health rate, we also have uh, money for respite care in here, which is very important. We heard really compelling testimony on that. We have additional money for school-based behavioral health grants. I mean, we, we have a serious problem in the state for, you know, mental health care. And um, I think this is really moving forward in a lot of really good ways, some of which are kind of small money ways right now that are kind of setting us up for future um, improvements. And so um, just really proud of this bill, and thank you. Thank you for hearing it. Thank you, Representative Liebling. And so with that, House File 4571, as amended, has been laid over. And as I mentioned, just stay tuned to when we'll come back today, um, likely sometime this afternoon um, after the floor, as I mentioned, gets started. We have the possession of the Senate file. And so with that, we are in recess.